Hello, happy Friday by happenstance. Today, as you saw, we are going to be talking about The Vaster Wilds by Lauren Groff, returning to the eponymous vastness and the violence of colonial America, following a girl who at first remains nameless as she ventures outside her colony, which I don't know if it was ever named as Jamestown, but I do believe was meant to be Jamestown based on what I have read, and ventures into the wilds for some perceived crime. And she has with her just a few items for survival like a hatchet and some boots, her memory of the map of this place, and her spirit as she seeks to get north to the French colonies. Now I just finished this book so I unfortunately had not read it when I saw Lauren Groff in conversation with Rebecca Mackay at the Newberry Library and I wish I really did have a little bit of that frame of reference. They were admittedly talking a lot more about the craft in general but we did obviously talk about this project and this undertaking because this is a follow-up to Matrix, and while it is in direct and undeniable conversation, it is subtle and it is not necessarily a trilogy as we would think about it. I believe Groff did name it a triptych, and I am so incredibly interested to see what this last narrative is going to give us in terms of how it may reframe some of the thoughts that I have going based on what this book adds in conversation to Matrix. So I talked about Matrix two years ago-ish now in a feature Friday, so feel free to jump back to that if you want some more reference in terms of how I'm talking about this book in conversation with that book, because I am definitely framing my kind of response to The Vaster Wilds in relation to Matrix, in the sense that both books feature a woman at the outset who has been thrust out of her version of society for some perceived crime. Now in Matrix, to my recollection and interpretation, it's the crime of loving. Here, we don't really know what the crime is at the outset, but we do know that we have this girl fleeing a particularly dire situation, and not just in relation to some perceived retribution for an action, but because she mentions the starving of this colony. There is a desperation to this place, and the sense of being isolated amongst the vastness, and how this is contrasted against her memories of society in England, and how the kind of breakdown happened. We don't spend a whole lot of time in the colony as it breaks down, we see that real stark difference after. And everything is told through these memories. So like in Matrix, we do not have traditional dialogue here. This is in many ways a meditation in terms of the form. It's about 250 pages, so it is short and concise. But at the same time, I'm not going to use again words like language because I had read that Groff considers those words kind of gendered in description. And while I have not really analyzed or been able to unpack my own use of those words because I admit that I use them quite freely, I do want to respect that. At the same time, Groff is so known for her language and her use of language. And this gets into some of the kind of contention with this novel. On its face, this should be everything I don't like, right? Because it is a woman woman versus nature story. It's focused on the sense of survival. There are so many depictions of eating gross things, two instances of eyeballs, yum. And this is so intentional. And it has to be, right? We have this very concise narrative where we're jumping back and forth between this really survival-focused present and this slipping into memory in the past and this kind of contrast of these circumstances. And in this, it feels like our kind of journey into the wilderness here really is a kind of meditation on society and the human spirit. And because of this, while I don't feel like the narrative is didactic necessarily, it is much more of a kind of meditation and a kind of philosophical musing than it is a straightforward adventure. So in this I was browsing the Goodreads reviews in a very cursory kind of way on the train home because I was trying to kind of frame my thoughts and kind of form them, firm them up a little bit in order to be able to present them here. Now I'm not saying I'm going to succeed, but that was the goal. And in so doing I came across a negative review from a reviewer at the Washington Post. And there was a comment under this that particularly struck me because there was a woman, and I'm going to block out her name, who basically said, you missed the point entirely. And I hope the women in your life, this is the kind of paraphrased version of it, kind of inform you 
how much you missed the point. And he seemed to take some umbrage with that and said, you know, I had many women in my life who responded the same way as me to this book. And I understand both sides of this conversation. I think this is going to be a very controversial book in a lot of ways, because you're going to have people going in. And I think part of it is the framing of his original review was what struck this commenter wrong. And I kind of agree because it was kind of framing the Vassar Wilds against these adventure stories. And that is not what the Vaster Wilds is. And while the reviewer pushed back against the idea of this complaint being gendered, and while I don't believe it was sexist or intended to be, I do think it was approaching what the book was intending to do from the wrong perspective and not judging it on its own merits. Because this wasn't attempting to be an Aristotelian narrative. And like we talked about with Matrix, and like I told Lauren Groff herself at this talk, this book kind of sent me down another spiral with Helene Sisseau's Laugh of the Medusa. Now I don't think it works quite as well here as in Matrix necessarily, but we're again kind of talking about that circular structure. Now I am not the person that is going to be able to do the full literary analysis of that and how it is working within the text, because just the essay of The Laugh of the Medusa still hurts my brain a little bit. And I hesitate to go too far down this road because of Groff's own kind of pushing back against gendered compliments in relation to her writing, in relation to things like languid in relation to her prose, but I definitely think she is attempting to write and explore in a way that is not centered on that climactic plot structure. And so our character is going to react to things much differently in the moment. The prose is going to move much differently because we are not operating within that Aristotelian model, and it is going to feel slow at times. I definitely felt like we were kind of spinning our wheels, not moving at times. Now one of the things that really saved this for me as a reader was one, the specificity of the language. And this goes back a little bit to Groff's writing style too, which she talked a little bit more in depth about at this talk and indicates that she has talked about this before. So if this is repetitive for you, I apologize. But she basically goes through rounds where she will write the entire book scribbled longhand in a notebook, and then she will just put it aside and start over. While this process is already so kind of mind boggling to comprehend in terms of the creative process, I mean, I get it, but considering especially work like Matrix and the Vaster Wilds, where so much of everything is really rooted in the language, in the character development, in that kind of character study and the study of everything around them, it is really impressive to think about an entire book, multiple entire books just being cast aside. And these are cast aside in order to reveal the truest sense of the actual novel. And it's very interesting to think about this style in relation to what the book reads as, because I read it almost as this kind of collection of small descriptive bursts that weave together into an almost montage. And then we have the flashbacks inserted as well. And again, there is no dialogue throughout any of this, which is particularly interesting here because we are putting our character against this grand expanse of nothing in a sense. And it talks about in the narrative directly how she is so used to company and chatter and she is a servant of this household. And so she always would have been surrounded by people in some capacity. And so by venturing off on her own, this is her first real time alone with her thoughts. I would say still, but she's not. She has to be moving forward and the sense of momentum there and the sense of kind of fruitless momentum in some ways, especially as we see her kind of veer off course. Now, to be fair, if I was the one venturing, I am notoriously geographically challenged. But the way that we kind of discover this as a reader is interesting as well, because we are in the third person and we are following our protagonist very, very closely to the point where it's like this very close, omniscient third person. But then every once in a while, we will kind of veer off to the side. And I felt that it had a real sense of kind of almost cinematic movement to it in how we would zoom out. There was intention in how the narrative moved us from one perspective to another, and the writing within that intention was incredibly compelling. And the writing throughout all of this is incredibly compelling. Now, I didn't mark any specific passages necessarily like I did in Matrix, the kind of descriptiveness of it. And some of it may have been that the descriptiveness of it in this narrative was much more stripped down, bare, 
raw and violent in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of that was this exploration of the breakdown of society and also kind of contrasting the wilds as we think of them against the wilds of what society really is and the dangers of both of them. Because our character in this is never safe no matter where she is, when she's in society, when she's in the wild and the dangers of both, but that she by her own will alone is what pushes herself forward in both and how she has a little bit more agency in that in the wild. And there is so much kind of philosophical, theological almost underbelly here that I'm not able to fully unpack and articulate, but I find the kind of theological side of things very interesting, especially in relation to in Matrix, we had a much more traditionally religious setting and how religion was handled in that book and how distant almost we felt from religion. And here we're almost in some ways the exact opposite, though we definitely complicate our protagonist's relationship with the divine, where she finds the divine, what that means. Again, I say this is almost philosophical because we are presented these scenes that kind of make us grapple with a lot of these things. And while our protagonist is almost kind of in conversation with the voices in her head related to some of these bigger ideas, it's not in a way that gives us as readers an answer, but is a way of her kind of working through these ideas that she's never had to sit with necessarily on her own in the way that she's having to kind of grapple with them in the narrative. I also like that, as I mentioned, in relation to this book kind of complicating this idea of society and what wildness is and where wildness is, the further we get into the eponymous wilds, this idea of the forest as we know it, and you know I love a good forest, the further we complicate and show the kind of harsh, stark, wild realities of society. And so while, like I said, there isn't necessarily a traditional Aristotelian structure, there is this kind of amping up, especially because there are all of these kind of unknowns that are lurking in our protagonist's past. So we're able to kind of put the puzzle of her together better as we move throughout the narrative. And in some ways, kind of putting the complete puzzle of her together is the goal, is the journey, and is the kind of freedom that she gains through this journey. Obviously, also, we have the woods as this liminal transformative space, something I enjoy about the setting of the woods so much but we're seeing it from a much different perspective here than we see it in a lot of other scenarios because we are watching our protagonists forced to kind of make these choices which we do see in these kind of narratives a lot but forced to fight for her own survival and we see like I said the real violence of that. We have these incredibly descriptive like visceral moments especially when it's talking about the wearing away of her boots which are a luxury but the way that the nail and the sole starts to rip into her skin and just the way that you can almost feel that and in relation to the food she is coming from a starving colony and I would put some major major warnings in relation to food in this narrative, to the violence of it, to the grotesqueness of it in relation to how we might consider some things today and also the desperation and also what starving and the desperation of hunger has been proven to push some groups of people to in desperate circumstances. And at some points I will admit that I felt that it became a little gratuitous, but at the same time I think it is forcing us as readers to kind of confront the baseness of what survival really looks like in contrast to the kind of modernization that we have today that has removed us from a lot of the violence that is so natural to remaining alive in a lot of ways or what have you. And also it's forcing us to look at that constant choice that's being made. It's showing how difficult it is to remain alive as well as the kind of mundane nature of having to complete these tasks. And so I've been kind of grappling with the idea of what the central exploration of this book is because I do think it is in conversation with Matrix in the sense of what societies look like. Matrix, we have this kind of exploration of what a community of women and women with power looks like. And here we are in a much different version of society and the violence that that begets. And so it's almost this kind of idea of survival, but also isolation versus community in some ways. We go back to this idea that our protagonist chooses to remain isolated in the wild in a lot of ways. And again, both books are really kind of dealing with the dangers of the wider world. But even thinking about the pictures created in both, Matrix is kind of centralized for me around this idea 
of a labyrinth or a maze in a lot of ways. I mean synonyms, but you know what I mean. And then here we have this idea of this vast forest. So in Matrix there is this sense of containment and in some ways it feels like our characters in that are trying to contain their feelings in a lot of ways and here we have this kind of release of that both represented physically with this forest but then also this kind of releasing of anger in a lot of ways from our protagonist who is finally named in the narrative but all these names seek to diminish her in some way whether it be the lamentations that she was christened with at her foundling house or the Zed she was given when she moved into her mistress's home, but there is this definite diminishing of her. And so by going out on her own, she is able to step into herself in a way. I also found it really interesting in relation to looking at Matrix as opposed to the Vaster Wilds, because in Matrix we really have a woman coming into her full power in menopause, and here we have a young woman just kind of outside puberty in her like late teens. And so we have these two ages where women really have the least kind of power. So what putting them at the center of this and them being able to claim power in some way means and what that power really is. Because here it's a very personal journey and very personal stakes. And some of that moving in and out of the narrative, kind of pulling out to the bird's eye view in some cases, is kind of positioning our protagonist and showing how small she really is against this place. And so it's this sense of how you measure measure up against the bigger world and how you can still have an impact, but what that looks like. And so framing this as a historical novel is interesting because absolutely it undeniably is a historical novel, but it is also so kind of internal that it really isn't necessarily playing against the history as dynamically as we would traditionally think in a historical novel, but more using it as the kind of meditative jumping off point, but also still places us so distinctly within these worlds while also holding them a little bit at arm's length because of the narrative stylings. And I do think that the narrative style is what helps keep me pushing as a reader through this in relation to this real emphasis on the kind of nature of it all and the survival there within, both the way that this kind of episodic nature keeps us moving and then also the way that the flashbacks enter into the picture and the way that everything melds together so incredibly smoothly in relation to forwarding this journey I think works incredibly well. I feel like I've been talking about this for so long and I've barely scraped the surface and at the same time have also said everything and nothing. But that being said, I think I'm going to leave it there. I have barely touched on the kind of explorations and the flashbacks, which are so meaty and interesting. There is so much that can be dug into in relation to our protagonist's mistress and how she operates within society and claims power and how she uses her womanhood. There are just a lot of intricacies and layers here considering this is such a compact narrative and I am incredibly interested, like I said, to see how this and Matrix will ultimately be framed against the last book in this kind of sequence and what we are ultimately building to. Although building isn't the right word because that implies an Aristotelian structure and that is not what we are exploring here, but rather we have these three presumably works that are in this interesting conversation with each other. And ultimately we won't know the full conversation until we get that last book. But I would be so interested to hear your thoughts on what this book is saying, what we are getting here, the kind of exploration of society versus the wild and the kind of struggle to survive out amidst these vast wilds. But bonus points for Hatchet. So let me know what you're thinking. Thank you as always for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. Read something good. And yeah, bye.